aka Miscellaneous Brown, back with a new iteration of Miscellaneous and Brown. If I'll just remind you that uh, back in 2020, I was approached by Phil Ams for Biden to do a Daily Show esque type of online video or a vlog, if you will. Um, kind of hoping and pushing Filipino Americans to vote for Biden and not vote for Trump. Um, I think it worked out really well. And so I thought that for this election, it would be better to start that early. Um, I, I started that in the summer of uh, before the election of 2020 and I decided that because I already have a podcast right now called the Kanakuyas with Mitch Narito um, and I thought that you know we've got the podcast studio set up here the one two productions is all set up with our, 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 our new podcast studio and I thought that I should start up that miscellaneous and in brown podcast again and you can go back look at season one if you'd like Go on YouTube and you can watch, uh, not a lot of views on YouTube, but a bunch of views on Facebook, which is why I did it. Um, a lot of Filipino Americans and the Filipino Americans for Biden Democrats, uh, Filipino American Democrats uh, approached me to do that. And I posted most of the videos on, on Facebook. Um, I got to podcast with Rex Navarrete and... Uh, John John Priones, so it was it was a really cool and great experience, and it was fun to have to write jokes and stay poignant, and you know, give my fit, comment co- my comical commentary on the goings on and what was going on during 2020, and I thought this year <laughs> is a little bit different story. Not to say that I'm I everything that you watch in Miscellaneous and Brown season one. If you watch any of the videos, go back and you, you're like, oh, I'm I'm intrigued by this guy who's now podcasting. Um, and you go back and watch any of those videos. I stand by and agree with, and still, you know, 100. I'm I'm still voting for Biden this year, and I'm still, you know, against highly against uh, the orange one who will remain nameless for a little while. I, I don't really need to... He get, his, na- his name gets mentioned enough, so I don't need to mention it on my podcasts. And that was really more of the focus of the first season. It was really just my comedic commentary on the middle of the pandemic and a lot of what was going on during the election and the debates. And not to say I don't... Of course, this is a very important election, and of course, who you vote for is going to be a very important choice for every American, but I wanted to center this next, this new season, this podcast, introducing you to people that will inspire you, introducing you to people that inspire me, introducing you to people that will help you and may hopefully inspire you to get more involved in your own community and how you can make it better and how you and what issues do you care about and what issues in your local community that affect you actually and truly affect you as a person you know whether it's for me how it affects me as a father or how it affects me as a husband or how it affects me as an actor or how it affects me as a comedian or how it affects me as a live performer on stage as a host or how it affects you know there's so many different facets to all of our lives and I want to focus on bringing you guests and people that will inspire you to live your best self live your best life that when I when I say that I don't mean like you know a self-absorbed life I, I, I mean a life that Because I feel like, for me, every time that I've felt most fulfilled in my life, 
is when I am when I feel as if I'm contributing to the betterment of all those around me, not just myself. And I think a lot of that comes from being a father, but I think it also comes from just, you know, being raised the way that I was raised and in Chicago where I where I grew up. It's just I'm kinda keep I I kinda keep putting, you know, having uh you know Ten Toes Down, as Angela Rye would say on the Native Land podcast, because I'm very inspired by their podcast. And, um, you know, it's just me putting my, 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 my foot forward and sharing my opinion, sharing my commentary, but also, again, interviewing people that will inspire you because they've inspired me. So uh, for our first guest of Miscellaneous and Brown, I want to welcome a very special and dear friend of mine, Mr. Aaron Levinson. Thank you, Eric. I've really been looking forward to our time together. Yeah, man. I, I, Because I was able to work with you on the Be Goodly Project. Um, remind me of the place where we went, the, the, the garden. We went we're... to Mudtown Farms and Watts there you with go. A, a wonderful team from Netflix. Yeah, and it was just such a cool experience because I, 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 wanted, I, I wanted you to be the first guest and I wanted you to be the first interview because your story is so wonderful to me. But it's also inspirational and to me a very, because you make it easy to be an example for other people. So, I mean, we really, I just want to hear and share your story with my listeners. And so if you could, even from like when you were a former baseball player and all that, you know, all this craziness, I mean, yeah, you've lived a crazy life and I would just love to hear your life story because I feel like your life story would inspire a lot of people to be goodly. Ooh, nice work working that in there so soon. Bro, I'm so um, good at this stuff. You don't understand. <laughs> I, I, I can tell. I can tell. Um, you know what? I think what I'd love to do is I think for our time together, I really want to make sure that, you know, the story that I share with you is both authentic and it's genuine and it's me. Mm-hmm. I think that, you know, as I get older, um, the idea of holding things back or being very measured, like they're just starting to leave me, mm-hmm. which is just allowing me every day to lean in and just be me. Um, whether it's from a creative perspective, whether it's from a giving back perspective, whether it's being a father, a husband, all of those things. Um, I'm just really starting to look at life a little differently. Mm-hmm. And, and I think the thing that's happening is, yes, I'm getting older. You know, my son's now a freshman in college. My daughter's a senior in high school. And so my wife and I are both starting to think about kind of this second mountain and that second half of life. And like, mm-hmm. what does that look like? And so I think what it does look like, it's me working on things that matter, that I care about. And that I really want to do, not have to do. Mm-hmm. And and to take you back just a little bit, just from a, a family history, you know, one thing that I think is important to share with folks is that, you know, I'm born and raised Southern California. Uh, my parents divorced when I was two, so I never really knew my father. Still not even sure he's alive or around. Um, and so I was raised by a, a single family, you know, like my mom and, and my sister, who's three years older than me. And, and that really impacted my life a lot. I don't think I realized it until recently, but it really impacted me and my life. And Therapy's and, a hell of a drug, man. It, it, it is. <laughs> it, 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 it is. It is. And, and, and the one thing that I'll share with you as well is that, you know, my mom... God bless her. You know, she didn't have a high school diploma. She never went to school. Like she really had to grind and figure things out when when my parents got divorced. And long story short, like she ended up, you know, ended up getting two bachelor's degrees. She went back to college when she was 30 years old. And then I'll tell you, I remember standing in line with her at Fullerton Junior College to register for classes. And I'm just going to tell you, like we didn't grow up with a lot of money. And I remember the units were $8 each. She had to pay a $24 check for her class. And I remember it crushed her to have to write that check, a physical check. I know we don't remember those things. No, but she, still, wrote, she wrote remember. a $24 check for that class, and it really hurt. But I remember standing in line with her and just kind of wondering, what is she doing right now? What is she trying to do? And can we really afford this? I'm tripping on the $8 a unit class. I'm sure anybody that's listening to this yeah, is I'm like sure. $8 for what? $24 for a coffee. Coffee's $8. $24 check for what? <laughs> 
for a college class? Oh my god! And I'm sure the, I'm sure the book was about seven dollars. I'm saying, um, man, God, Ali, and now and now you add a zero to that I, at least, oh, or a couple zeros. Now I, I'm in the middle of it right now with my son, oh, so my I, I totally get it. And so, like, I just remember going through that with her, and I remember like we lived in houses with other families, and I went to four different elementary schools, and we were just always on the go, and that mm-hmm. was probably just her in survival mode. I mean, that, that that's rough single mom lifestyle, man. That is. I can't even imagine because I, I grew up both my, my parents. I mean, it wasn't like without conflict. I mean, they were they, they didn't. It wasn't a perfect leave it to Beaver household, but at the same time, they grew up and they're still together now. They're still they're still angry and fighting at each other now, but they still love each other. So it's I, I'm 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 very lucky in that way where I had a, a full you know I, I, my sister and everything. I, I, I do consider myself lucky in that way, but also in other ways that's uh, the, growing up with them. But some in other ways can offer you the same reason that go to therapy <laughs> no 100 percent. And, and you know and the other thing i'll share with you too is that like growing up in that space like i didn't realize it till a few years ago where i realized how dysfunctional that was and mm-hmm. how i was always worried about money and scared and anxious and depressed and all these different things that were you know that i would go through mm-hmm. um but i'll tell you that like you know fast forward um and, and the story doesn't really get any better because my mom passed away from breast cancer oh my god when she was 59 and i was 30. So she never knew my son. She never knew my daughter. And when she passed away, we were having a lot of conflict as well. So she left us at a time where I was like, man, like there's some still some like business that needs to be done here in a relationship that needs to be built. And it never happened. So when she passed away at such a young age, it really just checked me. And it was like, yo, like this could end tomorrow Mm -hmm. for any of us. And I need to start thinking about relationships better. I need to start not being so transactional from a business perspective. Um, And I need to connect with folks and and build kind of my tribe up. And and I'll tell you that like, you know, not until about eight years after she passed, by the way, Mm -hmm. did I break. And I'll tell you, man, like, and I don't share this story a lot, but I'll share it with you is I was driving up over the hill on La Cienega to go to Culver City for a startup that I was um, working at and helping grow. And I just started crying and I broke. And I didn't know what was happening. Right. This is like eight years after she passed. Sure. And I realized I needed help. First time in my life that I realized I needed help because I always thought that like therapy and mental health, that was for the weak. Then boys don't do this stuff. I mean, and we all were that raised stuff. in that generation, man. I, you know, you just be tough. You just know, be I tough. The, grind there's it a out. famous line from a, a movie, Anthony Michael Hall, when he was trying to be a tough guy from the nerdy transition in his acting career he played that movie i don't know if you ever saw johnny be good oh yeah and and remember he like i think and it was a line where he said oh my god coach i think i broke my dick and then the coach said (laughs) rub some dirt on it and get back in the game and that was the that was our shit that was our lifestyle rub some dirt on it and get back in the game but but you know what's interesting about the rub the dirt on it thing like to me that's a really like male thing to say but i didn't have that in my life I, so I don't know where that came from other than maybe the media or the news or just culture or what. I, I kind of did have it in my life. Like I had like my high school coaches were a lot like that. Yeah. And, and, and even even like uh, in a lot, some, some of my, my grammar school coaches, like coaches, a lot of coaches in, in life were sports like oriented coaches and and because you you played you played baseball yeah when you were you, you so, all throughout like you, you all throughout even college and did you play semi-pro or no god man you just made my day though um, I, 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 thought, I, I thought you did I thought, I, thought, I thought you were like semi-pro or <laughs> so it's, it's interesting that you bring up the coaching because yeah i think that's where it came from from baseball and soccer and just playing for a really long time coach, i think that's coaches man the influence. and it because it, it, i mean that's literally coach is almost like the embodiment of toxic masculinity of our generation is get in there and man up. I yeah. mean, that was yeah. that, that was pretty much the coaching note. And, and I think the other thing with the coaching piece um, is also like if you're good at that sport, right? Like if you're that kid who can score that goal, throw that pitch, hit that home run, whatever it is, like you're definitely getting more and more of that pressure because they don't want you out of the game because then the team will fall apart. Right. And, and I'm just going to tell you like in the most humble way, but like I was that kid on the baseball field. I was that kid well, you, on the soccer I, if, field. If too. I remember from our conversations, you were the catcher, right? Yeah, so I, I mean, catch is the general on the, on the field. I know how that goes in and, baseball. And, and and the thing I love about catching is that like my point of view, like I have a truly unique point of view on the field, where I'm the one looking out at the field, not into the field, and I can see a lot of stuff that's going on. And and I think the other thing about catching, and then I'll I'll move on. I promise. No, no, is keep going, man. I, this is awesome. When when that guy comes into that batter's box, 
I'm watching them. I'm squatting down behind the plate. I'm looking up. I'm seeing if they're grinding their teeth. I want to see what they're doing with the bat. I watch their feet. I want to see how they're aggressive they're going to be as they're coming to the plate. And then I know what pitch to throw them on the first one because they're going to try to crack one. Right. So you throw them the off-speed one. So I think the, the reason why I tell you that is that I did recently realize that I'm definitely an observer. Mm. I pay a lot of attention. I take a lot of notes, mental, physical. I keep notes on my app as things come to me. And so, but I do think going back to the growing up part, I think a lot of it just comes out of fear and stress and shame of just always being like feeling like your back's against the wall and paying attention to everything and making sure there's not danger. And so I I think as we get older, some of the anxieties that we carry and the things that, that, you know, the, the, traumas that we carry throughout our whole life and in our childhood we we we've done them so many times and recycled them so many times in our lives at this point in our lives because we're, we're older now we're in our middle age that you don't want to do it anymore you get to a point where you're like nah i can't nah I'm, yeah. i don't want to keep recycling this i want to try something new and and i think part of that is you know that realization within ourselves that we keep doing it uh, for me, the focus right now is like, I want to be happy and I want my family and myself to be healthy. That like, that's it. That's and it. I think that going back to what you just said, like, I want to work on things and do things that make me happy, that keep us all mentally and physically healthy, mm-hmm. where this mental piece is definitely something new for me. Um, but I definitely recognize it and I'm very aware of it now and I don't mind talking about it. Right. Because one of the best things I ever did was go to therapy and get some help and find somebody. And and I remember it took me a, it took me years, by the way, with the same therapist. Um, and the one thing I remember saying to her after a, a, quite a while was, this is the most honest conversation I get to have every day. And it's still true today. Yeah. No holds barred between four walls. Let's get after it. Well, see, but that unpacking allows me to just release and get it out there too. And I'll say, I also have been to therapy and I'll tell you like the fir- that first session was a release to the point where the, the, the therapist was like, she's like, are you, cl- I, are you cool? I mean, do you need some medication or something? No, I'm cool. I don't need medication, mm-hmm. but I'm just, I've never, like you said, I've never had that honest conversation with a stranger before where I just bared my soul out. And I think that that process really allows you to then the process of therapy all, all the different sessions and all the different ways you, you you it's a way of of self-evaluation at the end of the day because and if you can't evaluate yourself then how are you going to then out release evaluate your kids evaluate your life with your wife with your career yeah. it's hard it's it's hard to do any of that stuff if there's no balance within your own self true and, and i think that once you find that balance and you find whatever you're looking for uh, i started reading books about you know buddhism and zen stuff and all this stuff and it's just fascinating how just trying to be present as easy as it's, it's you can say be present. It's actually really hard mm-hmm. to just be present and not think about the next thing or worry about something. I mean, my whole upbringing was worrying about where was I going to live? Where was I going to sleep? Um, do we have enough money to pay the water bill? Like I remember the time the fucking water bill was turned off, man. Like the mm. water was turned off at the house. And so like all of that stuff, as a 48-year-old man, I'm still dealing with this stuff. Right. But I now have some tools and I have help to get there. Right. And and I think to, to kind of transition to just to share a little bit more um one thing that i'd be remiss if i didn't say is that you know i ended up marrying my high school sweetheart wow and so christine and i met when i was like 15 and she was 14 we met in biology class in Boynton park high school and like we met in high school and you know we've been married it'll be 23 years in june congratulations bro that's awesome and so when you grow up though in a situation that's so dysfunctional to then go marry somebody who's not dysfunctional Mm -hmm. and is fully functional like that's been the foundation for me over the last 30 plus years you know what we're we're very similar in that way because my wife is grew up in a what you would say would be a single mother household her father passed away when she was four mm. and that was like we, we shared these stories with each other in the first date kind of thing and then bared our souls again like one of those i always like i, I find a connection with people with it that, that when you can really you know be honest yeah because part of being honest for me is is the basis of my life because the first book i've read in comedy was titled truth mm. in comedy 
by Adele Close and Sharna Halpern of uh, Second City and Improv Olympic. And uh, truth in comedy has always been my mantra for everything. And truth in comedy is also what people, a lot of people don't realize when, they're sit, when they try to be a comedian or they try to write jokes or they, they try to think of something elaborate and crazy and you know, out of this world. When in fact, the things that are most humorous to us, the things that we find most funny and sometimes tragic, which is the other side of the coin, right, in drama, is, you know, truth. The and, truth of the matter, the actual <clears throat> truth of the matter. And, and I think that, you know, with truth, I think people engage more with you if you're being genuine, authentic, telling the truth. Mm -hmm. And I think you're definitely going to engage people where they're going to go, you know what, that happened to me too, man. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that happened to you. That happened to me. Mm -hmm. and, and I think you start forming that tribe, the bond of just telling stories, but they're genuine, real stories. Exactly. And I think for years, though, I held back on telling those stories because from a career perspective, like... You know, I'll just tell you, like over the last 20 years, from pre-revenue startups to $400 million a year food companies, mm. like that's been the career path. And the career path didn't have any space for what we're talking about right now. Right. It was drive revenue, increase margins, build winning teams, and add, you know, investor value. All that, that corporate was it. speak you, told, you just threw at me right now yeah. is part of why I think there is a separate language for that particular field of work. Because... You almost have to take the emotion out of your whole conversation. Mm -hmm. I felt like every time I've been in a corporate situation, it like like when some, the 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 worst and hardest thing for me to hear one time when when I was in a in a, in a, in a corporate situation was someone saying, "I'm sorry, I don't have enough bandwidth for you today." Yeah. So. Basically, that's a corporate way of saying, "Bitch, I don't got time for you today. Get the fuck away from me," you know. And it's like, but I could, I could easily translate the context of what she was saying. I don't have enough bandwidth for you today, and and I feel like that 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 uh, that taking out of emotion in even the way that you speak with each other, even mm -hmm. even in so that you don't have an offense or an interaction of humor or any anything. You can't joke around, you can't, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's you, you talk about how you talk, with the way that you talk, it, it, it becomes a way of separating your emotions, separating your, the, the, the thing, the truth of yourself yeah. from, from the situation. Because don't nobody want to hear that. They want to know how much money you made and, and the margins. and the, Did and you the close numbers. the deal? Did you not yeah. close the deal? Is the number that I wanted to have mm -hmm. by my name bigger than it was before? The, the thing that is changing, though, is I definitely think there's some feelings. There's empathy, um, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. There's all of this stuff that's coming to fruition finally, mm -hmm. you finally. know, within the space. And, and I think that, you know, one thing I'll share. You and I sitting here is proof of that. Oh, totally. Yeah. And, and I think that. Um, you know, one thing I'll share with you is that, you know, early on in my career working at, re at you know, pre-revenue startups, like they, they haven't made any money yet. They've got a great idea, product, service. They need somebody to go to market to sell it to somebody. That was always my role. Then as I started to grow up, I started managing teams and things like that. I'll tell you, when I was 30 years old, I was managing a team and $10 million budget and I got fired. And I got fired because I was an awful manager. Mm. I didn't know how to be a manager. I thought you had to like put your thumb on folks to get things done, mm -hmm. and I quickly realized that is not how you get the most out of people. Yeah, I wanted to be a coach. Yeah, yeah, get but, in there and rub some dirt on it, and, it, it and get them numbers up. Exactly, yeah. but then, but then that cost me my job, and honestly, it was the best thing that ever happened to me mm -hmm. because at that point, I went and hired a career coach to go, "Hey, what just happened, and why was I such a bad leader?" Right, so I made the financial investment and the time to go learn how to be a great leader. And so what happened after that moment, and it was a great pivotal moment for me for getting laid off. You know what, I want to just interrupt you, that career coach. You yeah. know, I feel like sometimes mm -hmm. there's specific titles for people, mm -hmm. but a career coach in a lot of ways is a therapist for your job. 100%. You know? and, but I, I didn't know that when yeah. I hired her. <laughs> you know, when, when, when I hired Liz, I was like, Liz, like, here's what happened. And she's like, yeah, you deserve to get fired. Yeah. I'm like, great, so let's start there and let's like work on this thing. Right. And But the part of... <clears throat> part of your improvement, part of your, in, you're enabled to, to, to empower yourself was your, your in, a bit ability to see the fault in yourself. That's a lot of people don't, because of corporate culture, because of the coach telling us to rub it and rub yep. some dirt on it all the time, whatever, the, whatever masculinity, whatever toxic mindset you have, it doesn't allow for you to say, you know what? I was wrong. 
I agree with you 100%. And I think it took me a really long time to recognize that my ego was getting in the way of, of people and coaching and helping and all those things and really just simply being of service to other people. And, and I'll tell you, that was a great moment for me because then it reset how to be a great leader while driving revenue, increasing profits, building winning teams and all those things. It really gave me a wake up call and, and, and Liz and I still talk about it today. This happened to me 18 years ago and I still call Liz and we still talk about this stuff. Then what happened was I started getting into leadership. The businesses that I was in managing, growing and leading all of a sudden were not just like cute, fun startups with a great idea and no, making no money to 300 to 400 million dollar food companies when <laughs> you talk about like that's hundreds of, of people yeah a real p l i mean and that's hundreds of people's lives depending on yeah. all these different decisions yeah. that you're making it's a, that's a lot of pressure but it's also yeah. if you have the right tools and the right mindset here's the thing about that situation though is that when it's not your thing and you're just going to work on it right i'll give you a great example i went into the first food company to go work with baseball friends mm-hmm and I'll tell you, like, was it a mistake looking back? No, it wasn't. It wasn't because I learned, I actually got to work on a real business with a real P&L in a family run business. Right. And when you're dealing with family, that's a whole nother layer of, of challenges within the business itself. You and, are, you, you have to tell me nothing about working with family. It is a hard, difficult road if you decide to work with your family. Especially when you're not family. Yeah. Right, so me coming in and, and bringing being a in, skill set, and you're in the family, but you're not in the family. Yeah, Ooh, I, didn't have, I didn't. I didn't have the right last name on my jersey. That is a very hard dynamic, and I knew it. And, and I'll tell you that you know I left that organization um, because I knew that I couldn't grow it any further. I, my mm-hmm. name was not on the door or on the back of my jersey, and I couldn't do anything more other than what I'd done, mm-hmm. which was saved and made them millions of dollars. Right, and so I left that organization. Um, and I started really thinking like, okay, why did I leave? And I left because of empathy. It was in the middle of COVID. I saw shit going down with people getting sick and lots of stuff going on just around the world. Right. Mm -hmm. But I left because like I wanted to be, I wanted to show more empathy. Mm -hmm. I wanted to care about these families and these people and their kids. And nobody knew what was going on, man. I feel like it was, it was, it was May of 2020. COVID reset everybody. It did. Because, and, and I feel like if it didn't, if it reset some people, and unfortunately some people it reset it in a negative way. You I know, agree. Like to, to a conspiracy, conspiratorial, a little bit, you know, a little yeah. bit scary. Because I can understand why some of those, you know, and part of me wants to empathize with those people as well because it's like, I get why you're paranoid. I get why you're scared. Because It, dude, it was man, like the land of the lost, man. Yeah, like we just made a scary. right turn and we didn't I mean, know we were fighting at. over toilet paper. I, I mean, I'm just... That was a scary, weird, and if you didn't, I almost feel like if you didn't have a mental breakdown during that time, something was wrong with you. Yeah. Or you were really, really like a rock stable like my wife, because she was just like, bitch, pull your, stop it. Put some dirt on it. We're fine. Rub some dirt on it. You're fine. (laughs) Rub some bleach on it. You'll be fine. Rub some, yeah, rub some bleach on it. Rub it with this antibacterial wipe and you're fine. (laughs) I'm telling you like that, but that moment, like it triggered a lot of like my fear and anxiety and everything Mm -hmm. I just told you about from a kid, you know, Mm -hmm. from, from my youth. Oh, bro, yeah. And then after that, it was time to like kind of reset. I hired another career coach to really help guide me to figure out what did I want to do kind of moving forward called sure. age 45 on best money I ever spent. And, and Clyde and I worked on a lot of stuff about what I wanted to do, what I wouldn't do by the way. Sure. And so took another job leading, you know, this 250, $300 million seafood company out of Chicago. Uh huh. And, and this is leading me into be goodly by the way, because oh, I, know. I, I, I end up, <laughs> I end up, I end up, so taking a job as the president and chief revenue officer of a seafood company based out of Chicago with kind of global headquarters supply chain coming out of Norway. Sure. So if you ever had salmon out of Costco or Sam's Club, nine out of 10 times, it was probably probably our fish. Yeah. So back in, no, I'm into seafood. The problem was though, is I was commuting from LA to Chicago every single week on the plane Sunday, coming home on Wednesday, every week to grow the business. And I'll tell you what happened. Business is growing. Teams are built. KPIs are being hit. Goals and objectives. What's a KPI, by the way? Uh, key performance index. See, 
I'll be or indicator. Sorry, See, key performance index. I don't even. It's just I, goals. Okay, like, I get like you, you know, yeah. you need to do this and you do that. Oh, I think whenever they throw an acronym, there's a goal. It's it, a goal. It it's is. Like, it's like a, it's like a rubric if you're in <laughs> school and, and you're a student or a teacher. It's amazing to me. But I, like I said, KPI. Okay, I learned something today. It's like a four square with lots of stuff to work on. <laughs> um, it, it is, and so you know, all of that was set up. The team was set up. Everything was going well. And I'll tell you what happened, man. Like, I got a text message on my way from L.A. to Chicago on Sunday night saying, Isaac, my son, broke his ankle. He needs surgery Mm. from my wife. I'm on the plane, and I'm like, God damn it. Like, this this is, like, this, like, just this work thing. It ain't worth it. Yep. And here's the worst part. I was headed to Chicago. So mm-hmm. I didn't come back till Wednesday. Oh, man. To see my son with a busted ankle, getting ready for surgery and all this different oh, stuff. Oh, man. And I was like, man. How old was your son? He was a junior in high school. Oh, man. And so I just felt like a bad dad. I felt I feel like a you. bad husband. Yeah. And it really just kind of rattled me and it, yeah. it shook me. Um, and I think the other thing that, that I didn't share that I will is that having the, 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 the trauma and all the stuff, <clears throat> you know, from a childhood, like the one thing that I've really been working hard on is to not mess this thing up. I don't want to be divorced. I don't want dysfunction. I don't want my kids moving four different houses in six different years and going to all these different schools and not having friends and all the shit I dealt with. Like I'm so protective of that that I'm willing to do whatever it takes to protect it. Well, my goal as a dad, and I think it's the same as yours, is my only goal is to improve their life mm-hmm. on mine. Like I, I, as long as their life is better than mine, I'm good. Hundred percent. I'm totally good. And being honest, bro, I like I got two daughters that are raised in Southern California, who are cheerleaders that fly up in the air and flip, and they ride boats and go on a farm. And you know, I was on I was at the the farm in Iowa where my wife grew mm-hmm. up on, and and then they have a second home with a, like a boat. And I was sitting on the end of the boat, and I'm looking at my kids in the background getting pulled by a. A, a thing like a I don't even know what they're called because I didn't grow up with it I don't know what those big inflatable mm-hmm. buoy things are called but they're getting put and they're they're laughing and the joy on their face is so apparent and I was like ah I'm I did I did much because I had never been you know I'd never experienced the things that my kids get to experience so for me that that's my only goal as a father is to improve their lives upon mine I don't I don't need anything more than that. And, and we have that in common. And I think that, you know, as my kids are older, right? So one's, in, one's a freshman in college now. My daughter's a senior in high school. Like, my wife and I often will f- talk, like, on a dog walk and just kind of talk about, like, all right, what's happened since they were, like, born to where they're at today? What has happened? And it is adventure. And it is happiness. And it is healthiness. And it is that stability, mm-hmm. right? They yeah. know where to come every single night. Mm-hmm. They've got a bedroom to mm-hmm. sleep in and food to eat and all those things. And yeah, like at some point you're like, you know, I keep seeing these billboards that says something like, you know, you're enough, right? Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, yeah, we, we, like my wife and I, like we're a good team, we're good partners, we're good friends, and yeah, we've done enough, and these kids are in really good shape to go become adults. We're always going to be there for them, yeah. but, and my wife likes to remind me often that, hey, parenting doesn't stop, it just changes. Yeah, and so, I, I'm learning that with my parents, because they, you know, they, as they get older, you know, again, I'm lucky that they're they got elder. You know, because like you said, your your mom died when she was 59. Yeah. You know, I, I a lot of that mortality thing for me would became real when because I'm going to be 50 this year, and I got a lot of homies that just like I had one friend who had a brain aneurysm mm-hmm. and he's still connected. You know, he's right now still on life support, and it's it's can be that fast. Eric, I, I'll tell you that you just mentioning that just triggered something with me because a good friend of mine, a uh, baseball friend of mine, mm. Mike Jin, um, went to Cuba with us to play baseball, San Quentin State Prison to play baseball as a visitor. Um, that's a whole other part of the baseball adventure here. But, you know, Mike was in line at Staples Center and just like two months ago waiting in line for concessions or outside the bathroom or whatever, and he died. Dude, just and, – and the surgeon, from what I understand, the surgeon said that he was dead on the way down to the ground. They don't know if he had a stroke or an aneurysm, but Mike was 55 years old and just gone. And I was at his funeral a couple weeks ago, close to here. 
And so, you know, all of those life events, as like yeah. your friends, people you know, people you play ball with you or travel with or did a show with. Time is too precious. It's, and really, time is really the only mm. luxury that we have because you can make more money. Yeah. You can buy more shit. You can do, I can do all these different things. You can, yeah. anything that is replaceable and you can hold in your hand, you're good. But time is really the only luxury that we have as it, human beings. You, you're just spot on. And I think that, you know, that, that comment about stuff and things. Um, I don't need more stuff and I don't need more things. I'm actually starting to get rid of stuff. Um, <laughs> you know, on, on off or up or, 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 or off of Goodwill or selling the old bike. Like my son came home for winter break and he's like, yo, like I want to go fishing at the Redondo Pier. Where's the bike? I said, oh, I sold it. He's like, what? He goes, why'd you sell the beach cruiser? I said, cause you don't live here anymore. And he goes, how much you get for it? I said, $25. He's like, $25. I said, dude, you don't recognize like I had to give it to him for free. I yeah, just don't be, want it in the garage anymore. Because the space yeah. and my peace of mind is worth way more than that twenty five dollars. Totally. Yeah. And so you know, you know, and so from a business perspective, just to transition a little bit, you know, driving revenue, margin, building teams from you know, startups to four hundred million dollar food companies, all this different stuff that I was doing, that was a grind, mm-hmm. and that was me working my ass off for twenty plus years in a sales capacity and leadership capacity, and just no holds barred, go go go. Two years ago, though, I realized it wasn't sustainable. Mm-hmm. I just knew it mentally, physically, was not sustainable. Um, the idea of moving to Chicago or moving well, to mean, Tennessee, uh, it's just not going to happen. Getting into a plane, just me thinking, getting into a plane and knowing that your kid had a broken ankle, like the guilt of that. That I, if I just me trying to empathize with that situation, the yeah. guilt that I would feel like if I had to go to a show and my kid broke his ankle on. Or, Oh, broke her ankle on. I couldn't. I. I it, it, it. It would be unbearable. The guilt would be unbearable. When when you like when I saw the X ray, and his and that he needed plates and mm. pins to put it back together. Bro, I'm about to cry myself. I, like I'm like it wasn't like, like a sprained ankle with some crutches. Like it was like major surgery. Yeah. I was like, oh my god. Um, and so you know, at that point, that was two. That was about two years ago. Mm-hmm. And and at that point, I decided that the travel, the business, the grind, enough. So I took a break. Mm-hmm. First time in my life and my career, I took a break and I chose to take a break. And so I took a nine month sabbatical. Mm-hmm. And I'll tell you, my wife's an educator. I thought only teachers and professors took this thing called a sabbatical. Kind of had to look it up, see what it even meant. <laughs> and it just means take a break or go do research or something. No, but, but it, that that sabbatical, they, when you call it a sabbatical, it's different than if you call it a vacation. It sounds or official. It, 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 it's a different, there's a different, there's different connotations to sabbatical. Yeah, well, yeah, like, like if you're like, if you're taking time like, off, and listen, they're like, yo, man, you're being you're being am, busy. I am trying to master some shit. I'm gonna go on sabbatical, yeah, and I'm gonna learn. To, like it's when Willy Wonka went and tried all the flavors of the world. He went on sabbatical to mm-hmm. taste all the like when he licked the bugs and all that shit. That was his sabbatical for flavor. Yeah, it, it just it's official. It, it's it's an awesome word. I it like makes sabbatical. you not sound lazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like I'm up to something. Like I was like same kind of thing. After my first special, miscellaneous, you know, miscellaneous brown plug plug shit. Anyway, but but you know, like I, after my first special, I, I kind of didn't know what else to do. It was like eight years had culminated to this. And yeah. I'm like, uh, what do I do? So I kind of went on a sabbatical mm-hmm. as well, and I learned how to grow cannabis. Yep. And that sabbatical, that was my first time. Like you, I, I connected with the, when you said that's the first time I've ever took a break. I ever stopped grinding. Because comedy was my grind. Yeah. And, com- and, and, and but I never stopped to take a breath and take literally and just stop. It, it's amazing. I will share with you that taking that time off, it cleared so much muck from my brain mm-hmm. and so much fog and intensity and just anxiety and all this different stuff that I used to deal with, and it really just cleared some space. Yes. I was better dad at home. I was a better father at home. Um, I mean, hell, I took my nephew who's ten, who's a like he loves airplanes. I took him on his first flight oh, just to see that experience. That's so cool. Like I got to do that stuff. I love to see the look on their face when they enjoy stuff. He said, "I want to sit by the tail or by the by the tail, <laughs> like I know what airplanes are, um, by the wing, because I want to hear the engines roar." And he could tell when the engine turned on or off that click, what that meant, the yeah. landing gear moving. Because he was so into it, dude. Then he met the pilot, spent a half hour with him after the flight. Like I was so happy watching this kid get his first experience on a plane. And, and I think the other thing too that happened was, you know, I taught myself how to play golf 
during this time off. Yeah. I'm a baseball player, but I, things are starting to hurt, so I decided to teach myself how to play golf. A little bit slower pace, a little bit less squatting it, for you, and nobody, try, and nobody trying to get me out. <laughs> and nobody <laughs> trying to slide into you. Totally. And, <laughs> and I'll tell you, golf is both good mentally and physically. Oh, yeah. It's really challenging. Your your error, like the, your space for error is millimeters. I'm going to let you take me golfing one day. We, I, I, I'm not, I haven't, I, I've only golfed once. And then, you know, because I was at a driving range and they yeah. uh, they called me Happy Gilmore, just so you know. All right. So we're not going to play. We'll just go back to the range. For a <laughs> <bit>. <laughs> I don't want anybody to get hurt. Um, and so, you know, during that time off, though, like it really gave me time to reset. So about a year ago today, mm-hmm. I found myself in Cuba. I've been going to Cuba for the last 10 years to play baseball, humanitarian efforts, giving back. And, and when I was there playing ball, we would go and play six games in eight days against Cuban veterans world baseball classic guys olympic winners like just so much fun talk about like just diplomacy and like camaraderie but and also baseball. like with for the, the kids who took part in those games and saw those games you know examples and representation of heroes in yeah. front of their eyes doing what they love to do and why they became heroes which is also incredible that that and then seeing americans show up who don't represent what this embargo thing represents for the last 70 years, right? But also, I love you, because you sh- you've shared this story with me, and we've talked about this. You, you, you brought all this gear, and you get all this gear from all over the country, mm-hmm. because baseball gear is expensive. Oh, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's it's a grip to even just for the catcher. $500. Yeah. Easy. So you get all this gear to play these games, mm-hmm. and then you just... Leave it in Cuba. Yeah. It, it was, you know, after my first trip there in 2009, um, I realized really quickly that the Cubans didn't have the gear or the tools to it's play expensive. to play or to play safely. Yeah. There are no stores there. So whatever they have is what they get. Um, and I recognized that, you know, I was playing catcher. You'd have to leave your catcher's gear at home plate so the Cuban could come and put it on. And so you're just swapping gear and swapping sweat right. all day long. And also DNA. And oh, yeah. There's all kinds of stuff. Gross. Forget COVID for a minute. And you never know and, what freaky-ass baseball players. I know how you guys be getting Yeah, out. we didn't share a cup because <laughs> they didn't wear one. Um, so I, that never happened. But I did quickly realize I didn't have the tools to play the game. And so I did. I developed relationships with you know with Major League Baseball, Louisville Slugger, uh, Adidas Baseball, and things like that. And then, yeah, all the players on the team were the mules. That's awesome. Man. So I'm in Cuba about a year ago. Now what I do is I go back and I volunteer at the local Little League fields. I know all the coaches because I've played against them. Sure. And in Cuba, after you're done playing professional baseball, you go coach the youth, and that's your job. Could you imagine if Aaron Judge or, you know, pick a baseball player, Clayton Kershaw was giving pitching lessons at a local Little League? Mm-hmm. Like, that's what they do in Cuba. Shohei Otani. Dude, just, yeah, exactly. I'm sure you had to hit and pitch. And... Although, I will say, I, I, you're a baseball guy, and, and this is a quick, just specific pop culture question that I have. What do you feel about would, if Shohei Otani bought your wife a Porsche? How would you feel? I wish she bought me one. <laughs> but I'm saying your wife, because I'd have been like, "Why are you buying my wife on her birthday a Porsche?" It, but I, I guess you know, you know whatever. But it anyway, teach its own, I guess. I guess anyway. <laughs> I entered. I sorry. I no, no, no. It's, 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 all, it's all good. But I, I think that you know, a year ago, I'm at the local little league fields in Cuba, and I'm coaching. Mm-hmm. I'm sweating. I'm chasing mm-hmm. kids with GoPros and making right. videos and having fun and just being a boy again. And and I remember leaving that practice and I was walking back because everybody walks or rides a bike. And we were walking back into town in Cienfuegos, Cuba. And I just remember thinking, like, man, I am so happy right now. Yeah. Like, how do how do I get more of this? And why don't more people volunteer more often? Mm-hmm. And the thing about going to Cuba for me is that, yeah, it was a baseball adventure, humanitarian, but the thing is your phone doesn't work there. Right. So your phone is an alarm clock and a camera at best. There's no social media. There's no television. There's no radio. And you genuinely either connect with yourself or the local community. Yeah. So I just started kind of writing things down and thinking about, like, what could I do and why don't people volunteer more often? So this is where Be Goodly was created, was being away on right. sabbatical, thinking about how do you get more people to volunteer more often? So I started writing a business plan and thinking about things and looking at other businesses out there. And I'll tell you what happened. I started, I came home and I met with corporations and employees and I asked them about volunteering, team building, team bonding, company culture, uh, community service. What does all that look like? Mm -hmm. And the things I heard were very clear from all the people I talked to. And that's a real big part of like how I'm strategic and thoughtful and try to put things together. I talk to a lot of folks, I take all the puzzle pieces and then I put it together and try to go solve for something. So I met with all these folks, talked to them, and they said a couple of things. We have nobody here to plan that stuff. We don't know where to go, what to do. And it's really difficult to go volunteer with more than, say, 10 people. 
group volunteering, at least here in LA, is a big challenge. So I was like, all right, cool, put a pin in that. Then I go to talk to the nonprofits mm -hmm. and the community groups. And I was like, hey, what's it like when groups come in? Ah, and I heard things like groups make things worse. Uh, I don't have time to babysit them. And I don't have the staff to coordinate your volunteer field trip that you're putting together. Right. So with that, I was like, cool, I'm going to solve for the whole damn thing. And I'm going to make corporate volunteering as easy as just getting on the bus. Right. I'm going to plan the day. I'm going to pick you up. It'll be hosted by a talented host, <clears throat> Eric. <laughs> sometimes, and, sometimes, I mean, yeah. You got, you got other hosts. You got Denise. You got and, and, and so many. You met a bunch of. But you, you, it, it's hosted by a lot of the, which is where we we come in and, mm -hmm. and, and you give opportunities to artists and, and different people who can host and and be a part of this be good legal organization and yeah. then they they get some income and help facilitate this whole day. Yeah, where, where you plan it with the artist and then they they work with the team, the corporate team of people. And like, cause we, when we went to Mudtown, it was such a fun experience. And, yeah. and, and, and everybody gets to feel a part of it. And like, it was just, it was such a wonderful experience. No, I appreciate that because you know, the, the dotting of the I's and the crossing of the T's, like it's how I operate. Like I'm an ex, like I told you that like I'm an observer, but I also execute game plans. And so once I collected all the pieces, I did, I built a social enterprise called Be Goodly and it's corporate volunteer field trips made easy. Mm -hmm. My goal is to make it as easy as just getting on the bus. And if I can do that, I've done it. And I'll tell you when you and I went out together and we took Netflix out, dude, I'm going to tell you what happened. We go to lunch, right, at a local mom and pop called Grilled Fresh. Oh, that was great. Just Caribbean food in South Central. It was amazing food. And and the manager of Netflix sat next to us, right, during lunch, and he asked me, so how long have you been doing this? And I said, you're my second field trip. <laughs> and he looked at me and he goes, man, I would have never known. Yeah. That was the ultimate compliment for me and us and what we'd created that day. Exactly. Because I did. I don't want them to know that I'm new at this thing. I don't even want them to, I don't want them to know anything it was other seamless, than to just homie. go out seamless. and give back to the community. The other thing that I'll share with you that I'm starting to see from this thing is, yeah, I'll plan 75% of the day, but there's 25% that's just organic. And the thing I saw with that team from Netflix and some other places that we've gone and groups we've taken out is these employees genuinely connect with each other. They may be a remote team, a hybrid team, don't really know each other from Seattle, New York, San Francisco, the LA. The effects of the pandemic on corporate culture. Everybody's mm -hmm. on a, in, a, in a little box and they don't get to see each other and yeah. connect. And, and now they're digging in dirt and, and, and helping to plant trees and plant plants and harvest fruit and all the, these other They are things. bonding over meaningful work and necessary and impactful work. And a couple of conversations that I've heard, like I remember on a field trip that we took, I heard two women who had just had babies and this was their first business trip away from their child. And they bonded over that while digging in the dirt and planting, you know, planting plants and moving compost. And I remember just sitting and listening going, yeah, this is genuine human connection. And I loved it. And that was not a plan for the day. It just happened. But I think that's again, when you're dealing in truth. Mm -hmm when you're dealing in empathy and you're dealing in a way where you're you're putting forth your vet, your best self-evaluated self you know what i mean and this is not a you know i'm not trying to push people to take therapy i'm not trying to do any of this stuff it's more about just a self-evaluation in in our lives and what we in our own individual in individual worlds and individual lives and our own like little silos that we are all in now with our phones you know, we can do our part. To that's, that's the other thing too about phones. Like another goal of mine is not just make it so easy that they just have to get on the bus, but put your phone away and engage with another human being. Yeah. And so the phones do go away. And the other thing I'm liking about what's happening so far, and we're just getting going here, is I like that you don't know who's in charge of that group. I like that you don't know who the CEO is or the VP of marketing, or the VP of sales, because everyone's got their hats back, hats turned backwards, their sleeves rolled up, their hair in a ponytail. Like everyone's just getting after it. Yeah. And then we get back on the bus and you drop them off and it's like, hey, Eric, who do you think was in charge of this trip? You'd be like, I don't know. Yeah. I'm like, great. Yeah, I got no that's idea. all that matters. I, I still have no idea. I know. It's great. I, I made so many Netflix jokes because it was during the strike. That we were <laughs> <thing>. <laughs> I do remember that. I'm sure some of these people are never going to hire me again. That's all right. It's you complete. know what's weird is I haven't heard back from them either. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, but bro, I, I, I have to say as a person, as part of that day, mm -hmm. as a person, as an individual, 
it, it, in my experience in that day was extraordinary. You know, it, it, to, to see an organization like Mudtown and how they transformed the soil that had been, you know, radiated and, you know, chemicaled and whatever other nasty verbs you want to have to that soil. And they turned it into this organic, lush garden that produces fruits and vegetables for the whole neighborhood. It's it's a really amazing place. But then to be able to meet, Nick, remind me of the lady who, who, who uh, runs it? Alicia. Alicia. And how we, 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 get, we were only there for, what, four hours, five hours? And the rapport, we were just joking around and all the different things. And, and I got to use her scissors and, and, and her clips. and But I got to feel the place. You know, I got to really empathize with the whole situation. Where, and then you saw all the people line up. Mm -hmm. when they were passing out the food and how the Netflix team was so excited to be able to pass out the food that they had just pulled off the branches and pass out to the people. It was just, it was amazing. It was an amazing, and, and then when you throw in the context of that it's in, in, in a food desert where there's not a lot of fruits and vegetables for people and they're not getting a lot of the essential, you know, things we need. And this is now a source for these people that never had it. Yeah. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a really amazing place. And then each time you, and, and this was just the one spot because it could be somewhere else that's mm -hmm. just as amazing and just, and does as much good and does contributes as much good to the society. And now you're allowing these people who've never been a part of it or have no idea of it to get a little glimpse of it and taste it. Cause it feels good to be, uh, it, to be good it really does it just really does feel good to be a, a good person and to, and to contribute to the betterment of other people and, and the other thing i'll add to that is there is so much of that that needs to be done here in la mm -hmm. right uh, uh, and, and by the way like the end goal here is to really activate la make an impact in la but listen if there's you know opportunities to go do be goodly in austin or san francisco or chicago or new york or paducah kentucky wherever um, I mean, the, your kids the, are in college now. You, now you can travel wherever you want. I can go wherever I go. I, know, I, I don't have to worry about that anymore. Um, but the idea of doing good and just making it easy for folks, um, I just think a lot of people in general talk about volunteering and wanting to do it, but they don't. And so I've created something that I hope is just really easy for folks to go do. Um, and I hope it encourages them to take their family out and go back to Mudtown or go back to the food kitchen, you know, to the to the kitchen or you make whatever. Friends. Oh, you my make God. Friends. It's hard not to when you just getting after it for the day well and that's that's part of the reason why i'm so happy that you're my friend because we be, be, become friends through this experience of be goodly but also i'm glad that you're the first guest on my podcast because you really are a great example of what the power of one individual can do if you set your mind to it and you get your mind right and you know you you, you, you cut out all the bullshit mm -hmm. and you just want to do good it's I, I respect and love that about you, man. It's such a great thing, and I'm I'm, I'm so happy to have you on. The, and and you know that this is just the first one. You can be on again, and we can we can talk about our next experience of Be Goodly, and we can talk about all how Be Goodly is going to go to New York and Chicago and Texas and all these different places. We'll we'll talk about how Be Goodly grows as we grow with our podcast. Because again, you're the first guest, and again, this is season two of Miscellaneous in Brown, and this is Aaron Levinson. Look, where, where, tell them where they can find you, where they can, where they can find more about Be Goodly, and where, and and we can wrap it up because I just really want them to know where they can get in contact with you if they're a corporation, or if they're a, a non for profit organization. How we can, you can be the middleman and facilitate more Be Goodly. I appreciate that. Uh, this has been an honor. Uh, super grateful to sit down with you today and have this conversation. And www.begoodly.com, just the letter B. Um, you can find me on LinkedIn as well. My name is Aaron Levinson, and uh, I look forward to connecting with uh, anybody that wants to go out and do some good around here. Right on. Well, you're the first guest, but again, it's the first, but it sure won't be the last. So welcome to Miscellaneous and Brown, and we'll look forward to your return. I'll see you soon, brother. Thanks, Aaron.